Good evening, class. I'm glad you're here. Uh, thanks for, for joining us tonight. We have a special guest. But before we get to our special guest, uh, I just want to acknowledge how famous Elizabeth Mukasa is. She was on a CBF podcast or, or video cast. You were like on a national uh, stage for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship uh, just this past week. So congratulations. Are you so embarrassed you don't want to talk or? No, I did not expect you to see that or say anything about that. When, <laughs> not only that, uh, we also saw uh, on CBS, they sent out a website, of not a website, they sent out an email of all the things happening that week. And so I was scrolling down and I saw you, I was like, hey, that's one of the students. And then like two announcements later, Grace and Hester's like a poster child for another thing. I can't remember what I was, I was like, we have a famous class. Our class is famous. So I'm honored to be your professor. Uh, tonight we have um, Ruben Ortiz who runs La Familia, uh, the Latino network for CBF among so many other things. He is uh, uh, all around cool guy and a, a beloved friend. So Ruben, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. This is my great pleasure to be here. And as you said, I think I was here in one of your class like two years ago. Yeah. It was a good, good time. So I hope we're going to have more fun today. It's a, it's a lot of fun. This class uh, is a pure joy to me, to be honest with you. Uh, the, not just the student perspectives and listen to them. They got a paper due on the first uh, that they're wanting this to be hurt, you know, done with so they can get right back to writing. Uh, but it's also fun because I get to invite people like you, uh, friends of mine, to have a conversation in front of all these students. So uh, it is, it's a lot of fun like that. So First question up, uh, what makes Ruben Ortiz, Ruben Ortiz? Oh my goodness, that's interesting. <clears throat> well, it's a melting pot, you know? It's uh, the great miracle of uh, the creator uh, that he puts uh, many things in a bowl <laughs> and creates a Cuban. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm basically uh, in love with my culture, the Caribbean culture. I'm from Santiago de Cuba. Uh, it's a, uh, Eastern Cuba is the second largest uh, city in the country. And Santiago main draw car is, is the music. So I grew up in the very center of the city and it was a very noisy city at that time, downtown Santiago de Cuba. So I think uh, that also has a, a lot to do with my spirituality because our, ho our house was uh, small uh, with a park in front of, uh, of us. And then since there was a lot of traffic on the streets, my mom uh, wouldn't let me go outside to play a lot. So in fact, part of, uh, uh, I'm also part of two generation Baptist. It was very quiet inside. So the city was very noisy outside and my house was very holy, holy, holy model, uh, <laughs> you know, very Baptist inside. And, um, uh, I was a kind of a reader, you know, from, from very early age. My mom was forcing me to read and to read, to read. So I have a lot of books. And uh, then I started studying music. So I started studying saxophone. I was a saxophone player. That was my career, my first one, because my mom wants, wants me to play in the church. Did you imagine the church that only has a, a piano and an organ, but my mom wants me to play saxophone. So, well, she puts me on piano and then I drew up, uh, you know, I, I, I moved to, to, to saxophone and it was the first instrument after the organ and the piano that was played in that uh, first Baptist church in Santiago de Cuba. And, and then the jazz influence for the saxophone, and that was my second community, my school. So I started looking for other horizons with my, my friends and hanging out and the, you know, the jam sessions and uh, improvisation. So I started uh, doing all that. After that, um, I, uh, when I was 21, I, studied, I started studying uh, journalism in Quito, Ecuador. And that was a big shift 
for me, leaving Cuba uh, and, and the music career and go to Ecuador to study journalism at that time. And th that was another part of my um, uh, holistic <laughs> uh, life. Um, many things related with art and also the, the love for the truth and the looking for the truth and that uh, very active spirit. Uh, and friends, friendship. I think friendship is, is also very important for me. So that's Ruben, and you know, uh, as I always say, you have to try it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know Ruben, you know the friend, you have, you have to try the friendship. Is it doing everything you needed it to? Uh, <laughs> Grayson, <laughs> and I love it. He unmuted himself. Hey, Grayson. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I don't know. Does anybody in class uh, speak Spanish? Do we have any other Spanish speakers? A little bit, says Heather. So, oh, un poquito. Un poquito. Good. <laughs> I grew up in Florida, so the Cuban community is very big in Florida. One of my close friends is... Uh, uh, the daughter of refugees who are here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. They came over as children refugees. They're Catholic though, hardcore Catholic. The Peter Pan. Yes, she mm -hmm. prays for me to be Catholic all the time. <laughs> well, Ruben, uh, tell me about your experience with Christian missions. I mean, uh, mm. we, we've, we've, we, I asked the same questions to everybody uh, and we've had, uh, Christine Browder, who, you know, has just now got to the mission field as a missionary. We talked with Matt Norman, who is a missionary in Barcelona. Uh, we talked with uh, a whole host of folks. Um, but what, what's been your experience with Christian missions? Very interesting. Uh, I, am, I think I am the rebel one, <laughs> the revolutionary one <laughs> in this class. Uh, Maybe you need to take some, take some patience with me. Uh, I'm, I'm more close to the model of Orlando Costas uh, presented years ago, centering the person of Christ. And that's part of my, my story. So if we talk about missions, we need to basically define the person of Christ. And Costas says that for Christian uh, contextualization uh, is, is, is a theological necessity. So contextualization is a theological necessity. Uh, and he was trying basically to explain the, that th there is not possible to understand God or humankind without the mediation of the God human, Jesus Christ. That's very close to the Latino culture, that uh, the, the model for, of the, the, the Christ that suffers, the Christ in the, in the cross. The Catholic Christ, in some way, is, is very close to her. Also, the Mary, the Mary, the ones that give everything. You know, the mother of the in, in the suffering. So, and, and I'm, I'm very close in, in Costas and some other uh, Latin American theologians. So, the the fullness of of God and the fullness of the human kind is Jesus. So, contextualization is is, is basic. We cannot think of God in an abstract meaning removed from human experience basically and and the mission was born from that from the suffering the human experience so god has an identity in jesus and jesus has an identity in the community of this the ones that suffers and that, that are persecuted or the, the ones that are living in the margins so for me it's just very the, the the model of mission is not based on first war and third war on trips or, you know, short-term mission trips. It's based on incarnation God. God is incarnated in Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus Christ was a carpenter from Nazareth. So it was men with, with a, a labor to do. He also was a prophet in Galilee. So he suffered uh, and his... Uh, his dead was an unjust dead, and he was raised from the dead by the spirit. And that has some implications in how we communicate that Jesus and that the message of Jesus in the world, especially in Latin America, on the poverty and the oppressed. 
I think Leonardo Costa talks about that too. Um, uh, Orlando Costa and Leonardo both talks about that. Padilla, Gutierrez, Father Gutierrez. Some of our finest theologians said that the, the mystery of incarnation uh, is where the early Christians, uh, early Christian community began to understand its mission and how to do that, that mission. So basically that. <laughs> That's I mean, it, I, you know, liberation theology uh, found a home deep in me a long time ago. So uh, I mean, I resonate with so much of what you, you said. Uh, and, and I mean, honestly, liberation theology is very different than, especially as a context and understanding of ministry and missions than kind of traditional European missions, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you could even say they were uh, diametrically opposed to each other in, in a lot of ways. And well, in fact, I mean, uh, the Catholic Church condemned liberation theology mm -hmm. when it was first kind of emerging. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's different now, but... Basically, because uh, the liberation theology gasoline is the oppressive. Yeah. So that's uh, the, is the poverty. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a, a nice thing <laughs> it's not a, a paradise offer but it's uh, the hell <laughs> yeah it's from hell it's from poverty where the mission flourished uh, and it takes all the fuel mm -hmm. so that's christian mission is the mission of the christ the quad christ the christ that was dead and resurrected from that so. <laughs> in liberation liberation uh, and its connection to salvation is, is a, I mean, it's the same kind of word, right? It's the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the word save, uh, salvation, um, in, in Greek, it means heal. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that is uh, directly connected to liberation theology, the idea of... We link that with uh, total health or holistic health, uh, salud integral, holistic integral, integral, integral health, and uh, holistic salvation or sal salvation. Salvation is uh, the, is, is uh, salus uh, and eirene too. So it's everything is, is salvation and is health too. So. <laughs> well, let me, I'm gonna switch this next one up. The, the next question is like, what are some essential qualities about the kind of Christianity you experienced or promoted? in your context uh, outside the United States, since uh, United States is, uh, you know, this it's problematized this idea of insider outsider. Uh, the question I wanna ask you is like, what, are, what is the difference in some of the essential qualities uh, about Christianity that you found inside the United States versus outside of the United States. Mm. Uh, and I know like even in, you know, the Latino, Latina world, uh, there's so much diversity. I don't want to, I don't want to like not think that there's, there's this homogenous Spanish speaking world out there. There's so much diversity within um, the Latino, Latina, Hispanic context, but how is that different than the kind of Christianity that you experience in the United States? Well, it's, it's very different. Uh, first is, um, I, I need, I, I think my, the, my model from, from Cuba is, is something that is always present on my approach to mission. So I grew up in a, in a socialist Cuba. So my mission model has nothing to do with, a, as I said, a well-known cross-cultural mission and mission agencies. Uh, when I grew up in Cuba, we have only one missionary, an elderly sister named Helen Black, who was, when the revolution triumphed in, in 1959, he stays in Cuba, he never returned to the US. So it was an incarnational model. So, she was not like the typical tourism mission or short term. So in, 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 in Sunday school and also in summer Bible school, they talked they talk to me about a, a, a Hudson Taylor and Adorina uh, Judson and William Carey. Uh, but for me, it was like they were talking about Peter and Paul. They were apostles, but they died. <laughs> 
So sometimes later when I arrived to Ecuador when I was 21 years old, and uh, I knew very well the missionary model from first war and the difference in between first war and second and third war. I was surprised for the, it was a, a kind of American way of life so they transmit. They live in the best neighborhood in, in Quito and they had children in, in the charter schools next to the mission, radio station was there. The children study in the Alliance College and Alliance High School and then they cross a bridge they didn't touch the, the streets, very interesting. So they cross the bridge and they go to see their parents. They take a car, they go to the best houses. I was surprised. They have their own hospital, uh, Los Andes hospitals, very nice. And the people talk about the Evangelical Vatican. They said, ah, you're, you're studying in the Evangelical Vatican? It's the ACJB, the radio and everything related with that. So, but I think very few missionaries uh, left that place and mingled with the Ecuadorians, um, unless they go to the beach and sightsee. <laughs> so it, it was a, a very, very strong model. And there were some exceptions, and I remember those very well. Uh, but missionaries were usually untouchable at that time. So everything that I trying to replicate right now is not that. <laughs> model <laughs> so it's very relational it's very uh, you know embraces the culture invite people um has a lot of honor a lot of respect for the culture and for me at this time the mission that is not compassionate that does not have solidarity that does not promote a reconciliation that is not a state with the weak in the society is not a mission that I would consider, definitely. That's the importance of, of CBF work that I am doing. It has a strong values on the lessons that we learned that we don't want to repeat. And I mean, you're, you're the leader of La Familia uh, mm -hmm. and all these um, Spanish speaking congregations that affiliate with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship at some level. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that's that's interesting space for sure, especially considered like the the missionary past of of the well, maybe not the past uh, Western U.S. missions, right? Um, what's it like to kind of inhabit that space as the leader of uh, La Familia, and how to like? exists within CBF world um, in this kind of cross-cultural space. Mm, very interesting. You know, it's a Baptist body, very diverse. And I am not in charge of the churches. I am just a resource. <laughs> so we have everything inside. We have the very conservative churches with the old model and they want to go to our countries, their countries of origin, and they want to do some kind of 101 first assistance mission, uh, you know, or what others call toxic charity. <laughs> uh, so we have that. And my first, um, my first interaction with those ki kinds of churches is just, I am here to help and, you know, let's, let's gonna talk, let's promote a dialogue. Let's gonna see other models. Um, I basically use the Cuban. <laughs> you know, it's close and you know, we have uh, every year we have two or three trips to Cuba with different churches. So I want them to see what has been happening in a country without missionaries in the last 60 years. And how is the church and how the church react to their own mission, you know, because they are the owners of their, their mission. <laughs> so for me, that's a kind of lab. So you're going to see uh, many of our churches that have been, I have been inviting them in the last year. And that's, that's the importance of the CBF work. And the other thing is the border, you know, you don't have to go to the, to Cuba, but you have, you can go to the border. We have many other churches that are not Baptist, many of them, <laughs> you know, Pentecostal churches that are responding to their needs. Uh, so that's another branch 
<laughs> of the work. And, and we have great resources in the area. We have the Jorge Zapatas, we have uh, everything ready with, with CBF uh, and Fellowship Southwest. So um, invitation and um, let's go to see, you know, like the Macedonian call, <laughs> you know, <laughs> come here and, and, and see and help us uh, is, is the first. Because it, missions is, is a learning experience. It's not even, it's not, a, it's not a class in the seminary. Missions is a learning experience, I think, for whole life. It's part of the Christian life. Uh, right now, for example, we are working with some of our churches in Texas. They want to go to Honduras, mm -hmm. but not to, to, to do typical missions. They want to invite Cuban doctors to go to live in Honduras. They are going to support them from here. And, and where they are going to, to live in a very impoverished rural area in, in Honduras. And that's very important for us. And it's a Latino church, it's a sí. Templo of Autista South Houston. They, uh, we are helping them in how to craft that model, how to try, and we have some good uh, trips to Honduras. I hope you're gonna join us. Absolutely, I'm just thinking about <laughs> uh, amigos in La Frontera uh, and how it's important to them to have a healthy Honduras because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in El Salvador and um, Guatemala, I mean, our, the Mexican Baptists in North, on, on the border, uh, they, the kind of work they're doing with immigrants right now, because the United States won't let them in, they are working nonstop. And we just had a pastor to die of COVID mm -hmm. uh, in, in right there on the border because he was helping all, all, all these folks. And so those, a lot of the impetus to go to Honduras and these countries to do missions is to help those countries kind of re, you know, restore some kind of something there so that people don't feel afraid of their life. By the way, there's no other way to deal with the, with the problem in the border, but in the countries that origin the, the caravans and, and the people in the Ukraine, there's no other way. And if we had started like 10, 20 years ago, now, uh, well, tw I mean, 30 and 40 years ago, the U.S. was a part of the, pro you know, created this problem. Uh, yeah, but that, that doesn't have anything to do with missions. <laughs> mm, another type of mission, military mission. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Ruben, uh, what is, what's the driving force in your cross-cultural Christian encounters? And I, I say that because you, you, you come at this at such an important space because you're from Cuba, you lived in uh, Ecuador, you are now live in the U.S., you are a resource to congregations in Puerto Rico, uh, southern Florida, all along the, the Texas-Mexico border, uh, and it, Connecticut, New London, Connecticut, you have a congregation there. All those congregations are so wildly different, uh, mm. and, and you are in a primarily Anglo denomination at that. So, what's what's the driving force in for you and your all these different cross cultural Christian mm. encounters? I think it's first, as I mentioned, respect and also curiosity. Uh, there, there are big problems with the titles and the positions in denominational stages, like the, you know, coordinator or executive or all that. Mm -hmm. Is that the people think that they they arrive, uh, they are in, you know, with power and position or connections, whatever they call. It. If you keep the, your curiosity and also the respect in, in this sense, is honoring what every church is experiencing and learning to ask some questions and questions that are honest and open questions. No close questions, but open questions. And that happened every time when I visit churches. What are you doing? Uh, how God is moving here? Uh, how we can join you uh, in what you are doing? Uh, and also I, I thank God that uh, when I leave Cuba, they leave Cuba, I didn't go directly to Miami. <laughs> so I go to Ecuador. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the goodness of God, 
he allowed me to experience another country. And then working with MAP International travel to the rest of Latin America. So that encounter with other cultures, you know, sometimes my wife said, now you're talking like an Ecuadorian. Now you're changing to a Peruvian because I know those places, you know, I visited and I experienced many things with them. So in US, I touch those fibers. When I, when I visit the, I, I ask the pastor, where are you from? So we start talking about culture and then we, we go to, to other places in the conversation. So I learned the sacrificial pastoral model of many brothers and sisters in Latin America. And I compare, I compare them here because one friend said, we are doing missions in the US with the budget of Latin America, still the budget of Latin America. <laughs> and it's very difficult. Yeah. Many, I think 80% of 90% of our pastors are bivocational mm -hmm. and they have two or three jobs and then church. And, and I value that, I support that. So I know that I need to communicate with them at night, 9 p.m. So I work at that night, at that time, not as the, the other coordinators or executives in other denominations. I don't want to mention, but you know, it's eight to five. If not, you don't call me like weekends. I, 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 I am still a 24 seven pastor with my phone. And you know, you know that because we talk in Saturday and Saturday and Sundays about let's go to Puerto Rico, let's do that. Yeah, I, so, know. I, was just, I was thinking about all those late night texts that we. <laughs> yes, it's, it's the, it's, so the model is open. It's a, the, like the pastoral model, Latin America, with the mentality and some of our good technology and iPhones and all the richness here, and the good books and um, you know AC. I think about for hate. Uh, Zapata on the border, who is pastor of Nuevo Vino uh, Bautista. Uh, he is the CEO of Hearts for Kids, who has sites in Spain. He has two sites in Spain. Did you, so he is like from South Texas and has like mission work in, uh, in Spain. And, and he made and, one visit. Only once in Spain, he has two sites. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness and, and, and we start a process with another country and let's say let's let, let's see in the next five two years what are we going to do five years no time for that five days yeah or hey he can make things happen in, with incredible speed uh it, it's, it's incredible and like that guy's always working uh i mean there there's no time when he's not working that's for sure Mm -hmm. All right, the, you, you've already answered this, but I'm going to ask it in a different way. Uh, how has your cross-cultural encounters in general uh, changed or shaped who you are generally, but specifically, how, how has it changed you religiously? I think the big one is ecumenism. Ecumenism. I did not learn that in, in ecumenism in Cuba the church was so close. We had one enemy. <laughs> it was the devil and the government. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the rest of the other uh, uh, cults or sects <laughs> that we don't want to talk with them. So the, the communist was uh, the, the devil and also ecumenism sounds very close to it, the communist liberal <laughs> theology and all that. But in Latin America, the crises are so great and the events were so catastrophic and the need for a response so overwhelming that a, a response is needed that comes not off from one group but from and, and no one from one institution or group or missionary group but from the people of god the concept of people of god changed me in, in the theology in Latin America. And with them, ecumenism, collaboration models, uh, alliances, networks, flexibility, have been great lessons on my journey. And that, that has helped me so much. It, even today, I consider myself a bridge, a bridge. And I have many friends. Uh, right now I'm working with a new, uh, group of council of churches in the US from Latino or ANCLA, uh, Latin Americans uh, Christians in the US. 
uh, we have people from CCT, Christian churches together, very good friends in, with the Pentecostals, bishops, the council of, I am, mem I am the only Baptist member in the Florida uh, um, FRASEF is a fraternity of uh, Pentecostals bishops in, in, in Florida. And I'm happy when I see myself in any of those places, raising my hands and singing hallelujahs. I don't have any problem with that. So that concept of people of God, the, the big table, the ecumenism uh, is, I think is key for the mission in this world today and shaped me a lot in many ways. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one of our pastors here in Mississippi, uh, and this was years ago when 9-11 happened, uh, the Islamic Center was not far from his church. So he went, as soon as he, that morning when he saw what happened, he went straight to the Islamic Center. Uh, and as a Baptist pastor just said, hey, listen, our church is here for you. I'm here for you. Anything we can do, because uh, I, I feel like there's gonna be some bad things coming your way, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, they just developed a really important relationship and they invited him, they, they honored him with something about 15 years later and asked him to come speak. And he said, <clears throat> and do you know Chuck Poole? This is who I'm talking about. The, yeah. Yeah. Chuck, uh, he said, um, in, in the way he says it, in his experience, the closer he got to God, the closer he got to all God's people. Mm. And uh, I, I find that true in my, in my own life. Um, it's kind of the closer I get to God, the closer I get to his people. And the, when I'm retreating from God, I'm also retreating from all God's uh, people. And that's, that's, a, that's a, been a lesson in my own life too. So th thank you for that. Uh, mm. Two more questions and then I'll let the class pepper you. You've already spoke to this, but what is primary in Christian missions specifically related to salvation versus social ills? What are we supposed to be doing? Saving souls or feeding people? Both. <laughs> uh, I think dialogue with the community that we are serving, humility, knowledge of the context, mutual relationships, all that brings salvation appreciation for the perspective of the other it is important not to uh ignore the also that that's, that's key the prejudice the bias in our own culture if we want to talk uh, you want to talk about salvation we need to talk about what is my concept of salvation and if it's the right concept of salvation <laughs> So bias, prejudice, is salvation is linked to my nationalism. Is salvation linked to my colors, the colors of my flag? So I think it's very important. If my salvation does not come from my dominant culture, so the, in this case, the European culture. So immersion processes are, are important, are key. There, there is no there is no differentiation in salvation and um, the restoration. So restoration, reconciliation, salvation is, is the same. Also these days I'm, I'm working in the idea of, uh, you know, some books on decolonizing Jesus. Very important for Latinos, for people living in the margin, decolonizing Jesus. For mission is very important. Uh, so I am trying even to uh, update, to be updated on my my own prejudices, because I'm a Latino, but I, you know, I have green eyes, and I look very American. So sometimes I have some opens that are door for me, based on my the color of my skin. When I talk, it's different, but <laughs> you know, at the beginning. I remember I was surprised for one of our colleagues once said, you are the whitest version that CBF encounters for Latino coordinator. And I was mad. No kidding. I was mad at that because for me, that's the, uh, that's sin. That's sin. And I mean, uh, when you were talking, I just 
thought about so many Latino biblical scholars, uh, Fernando Segovia and all the decolonizing the Bible, the, the volumes that he's written, uh, also from Cuba. Um, I think about Ada Maria Asasi Diaz, who taught where I, where I got my PhD. She created Mujerista theology. Uh, and I mean, right deeply, um, you know, the, in the vein of um, liberation theology, but specifically for Mujerista, these uh, female Latina, Latina um, context. Mm -hmm. And then. I this day we talk about the Mestizo Church, for yeah. example. Justo has been doing, Justo Gonzalo has been doing a great job on uh, looking on Mestizo Agustin mm -hmm. and bringing us uh, back the Agustin that we, it's a, it's a good model for us, so, you know, North Africa, Agustin and Latino, the Brown theology now uh, we Robert Chow Romero, the yeah. Brown yeah. Church. So <clears throat> ecclesiology, theology based on, on those models are, are very important. Uh, for uh, when we talk about the, the total gospel, you know, when, when they said that the total gospel for the total church is, is, the, is the total salvation for the whole world. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, did you know um, Leticia Guardiola Sanz? I know Leticia from the Academy for Spiritual for the Formation. Okay. She, she's one of our faculty members. I'm, I'm part of the the um, advisory board in the academy for spiritual formation that's one, another side of my yeah interest well, it was my department. professor when i was when i was in uh coursework and my phd stuff so mm -hmm. she's i took a class with her on the letter of james mm -hmm. at the same time i was taking a class with stephen moore on uh the bible colonialism and post-colonialism and it was those two classes that turned into my dissertation uh, on james and post-colonial uh, theory. So, but you know, it still happens. It still happens. Uh, you know, for example, we are signing a partnership with one of the seminaries in Ecuador, the mm -hmm. Baptist Seminary in Ecuador, Latino CBF Latino Network, and it's a covenant of uh, you know agreement and dialogue with them in our own way. And they they tell us that two years ago, a, a Baptist seminary in U.S. and a Baptist Association of Churches in the North offers them that they are going to pay everything in the seminary. They're going to put all the materials for courses and payment for uh, facilities and even finances for teachers with only one condition. Uh, they want to appoint a North American missionary as dean uh, of their course. seminary. Uh, thanks God they refused. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Because that, that was not a collaboration. A lot of not a collaboration of bad uh, covenant, but, but it, you know, it was a kind of a Baptist theological agreement of colonization in 21st century. <laughs> For me, I got it. So dialogue is basic. But dialogue is basic. No matter how much it takes humility, knowledge of the other, the otherness, uh, we find, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's important. All right, last question, Ruben. Uh, what do you think? I'm Cuban. <laughs> no, you're good, man. This is, uh, I mean, I think this is important for our class. I mean, the class is on global perspectives on ministry and mission. So uh, these are probably the most important parts of the class. Uh, so what do you think about Christian missions? What, what do you think the future of Christian missions is going to look like? Oh. <laughs> it, that's a hard question. I don't know, but it will have to be polycentric uh, because the, the, the world is, is very complex today. It's also very fast. Relationships are multidimensional. Um, the resources of the local church of the first world is now increasingly scarce. And the needs of the war are too great to think in uh, in the all missionary models. So it will be different, definitely. And whatever it is, uh, we have to do to do with. I, I think it's related with collaboration, as we talk, with integrality, with uh, diversity, with. Uh, global, multi 
multiculturalism, yeah, multicultural in, in the global, you know, uh, side with strong values in honestly, in transparency, mm. in um, two ways dialogue, equality. So I, I would like to see that. And also I would like to see that in the future we are we have we put more value in not in agencies or denomination, but in the in the people, in the lay people call, in the local missional agents of the church. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that more than in you know in the agency or the resources and the money, but in the in people, in people with names and context and so the narrative needs to go if it's global needs to be more local <laughs> the narrative needs to be more more local if we want to be global <laughs> I, you know i was just thinking like what would it be like for a mission sending agency yeah. to stop sending missionaries and start funding local christians uh and christian organizations that identify with that denomination from you know identity standpoint it is so difficult that we put that on paper in 2012 task force in global missions i don't know if you remember that so it's on paper yeah. but still in 2021 20, we don't have that model implemented Control. and i'm dreaming in people like javier yeah, yeah, Perez, that he was recently hired to help us out in this type of model. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had the class read an article I wrote, uh, or a chapter I wrote in a book, I don't know how many years ago, it's been a while back, but um, it was about Bible translation and who gets to control Bible translation. Yes. And uh, I presented that as a paper at the Society of Biblical Literature, and the president of the United Bible Society was, was in the audience and he was fuming mad uh, when it was over. And he was like, we, that's what we do. We actually do that. And I was, and I mean, this was in the, he kind of, we, that's what we do. And I was like, do you, do you do this? Because according <laughs> to this guy, you don't. And that's not been my experience. And he was like, have you ever been in, he challenged me, have you ever been a part of a Bible translation, you know, kind of thing? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, no, I've never led a Bible translation. And he even brought up um, the fact that they tried to pay Musa Dube from, South, uh, from Botswana to be in charge of a uh, Bible translation in the Swana language. And he said her fee, she said she gave them her fee and they thought it was too expensive for a native, for a native. For a native. Uh -huh. they have, yeah, they have double standard in that. Uh, that, that, that was a big question for us, for Latinos, four years ago with one of the big agencies here in Orlando mm -hmm. area, Wycliffe, uh, they, they fired one day all their Hispanic personnel because they were asking that, uh, the same, you know, amount of money and projects dedicated to uh, to missionaries from a first world was dedicated to the local ones, like in Mexico. We have good ties with with Mexico and, and that. So it's still there. When was that year that you wrote that? I don't know. The uh, students probably has the publication date on it somewhere. Uh, but it was, <laughs> you know, it was definitely uh, probably ten years ago. Probably ten years ago. But uh, the question still stood. I was like, why do you send an American to Botswana to learn Botswanan to translate the Bible from English into Botswana? Why can't you pay a Botswana New Testament scholar who can translate from Greek into Botswana? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that her fee was too high. <laughs> It's cheaper. It's cheaper to send an American to Botswana to live there for 17 years. I was like, no, there's her fees not too high. So uh, we got a pretty nasty argument about that. It was embarrassing, uh, but <laughs> in the middle, my I have, I have soapboxes. Uh, 
the class, what kind of questions do you have to, uh, that you want to ask? I think I wanted to comment about translation because that was what we're talking about, I think, last week in class. And um, are there issues that you are encountering in South America concerning how the Bible has been translated? And I know there is like a history between um, some of the nations in South America and the, lang the language, I mean, the colonial languages Spanish in most countries, but their local languages that are not that well known to the public is what does that look like in terms of mission and reaching out to communi indigenous communities in, that's, yeah, in, that's very good. in, in the places that you work? Yeah, very good question. Very diverse countries. Like we, we see in Mexico, more than 40 languages, indigenous languages and populations. And also in the Andes uh, countries, like in Ecuador, in Peru, in Bolivia, uh, Brazil, <laughs> they still have no contacts. They have a still, uh, you know, uh, peoples that are not, uh, they don't have contact with the, what we call civilization, us. <laughs> uh, so um, it's, 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 it's very, very complex. And uh, still, the, as uh, Jason, Dr. Cooper says, the, um, the, the power and the money guides all those projects in organizations like I mentioned uh, weekly for others and United Bible Society even. Uh, we have some different um, connotations or maybe arrangements with United Bible Society uh, and also with Biblica, so uh, New International Version. I remember <laughs> we were with Biblica, so, um, uh, New International Version. One of the things was that the New International Version was first made in Latin America and then in US. So that was a different, and that was a great job, uh, great work of um, brother um, um, Escobar and uh, also Rene Padilla. They did great because they have the contacts with the England. <laughs> side. So uh, it, it is always related with who you know and who's the best to do that and also the growing of the, the knowledge in the region. So f f that's the reason we value and in CBF we are working very hard on, on, on theological education. It is very important because we have more people well trained, we're going to have better access to projects that are uh, made by locals. Uh, but with indigenous, uh, it's based on money still and based on power. That happens with Mexico and Mexico has the best mm -hmm. uh, agency, local agency for uh, translation. Uh, I know them and they have everything with locals, but still they depend on uh, you know, money from outside, financial. <laughs> And just a follow-up question, Ruben, on a Spanish translation of the Bible, which Spanish? Who gets to determine which Spanish? <laughs> well, um, we have the, you know, the equal, like the King James, we have the Reina Valera, is our main uh, version, but we also have the New International Version, and those where the first one was made in Spain <laughs> and the second one was made in Latin America. That's the one I use. I use the, the NIV. The NIV uh, in, in Spanish is, is the best one. I know the people. And one of, one of them is part of our Latino network familia, Dr. Juan Carlos Ceballos. Yeah. You know, so, so people are still alive. <laughs> so when I have a question about the, the original text, I call him. <laughs> <laughs> directly <laughs> or it, it was great they translate the in the old testament they they translate um not mercy like misericordia but mercy as justice that mm -hmm. was a big change and it's a big change in the pulpit when you preach not based, based only in mercy like uh, misericordia 
but it, justice, because many, many of the passages in, in texts in, in the Old Testament means justice and no mercy. <laughs> so yeah, I, honestly, I think that's one of the reasons liberation theology grew up in South America, because it, even in the New Testament, uh, when we translate Dikai Sune, English translations always translate that as righteousness. Mm -hmm. And in Spanish, they translate as justia. Mm -hmm. Justicia. And so in Spanish, they hear justice. Mm -hmm. and in English, we hear righteousness. Mm -hmm. Righteousness sounds so re like a religious term. Justice sounds like a legal term. Mm -hmm. And I, I think j that's just that difference puts mm -hmm. you on a radically different path. You know, Definitely. Definitely. that's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big, big, big uh, work on, on NIV. That's the reason we use that, that one. Uh, still, the, the ones that we have in our memory, you know, for childhood is uh, the old King James <laughs> type, but we play with that. We play with that. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not a big issue that the Bible translation and the languages is always dynamic, as you know, and we have the new living translation to, and we have a version of uh, uh, Biblia para todos, Bible for all, and we have the very good job in, in the Catholic uh, uh, books, uh, uh, versions like in Argentina, the La Biblia del Pueblo de Dios, the Bible for the people of God. So we have other uh, sources and good job. Remember the Catholicism is, is, is very strong, still very strong in Latin America. So we have uh, wise people in that part of the church that we can consult in Spanish. I have a comment, Dr. Coco. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, sir, thank you. I, I have a plan to use one of your quotations, missions is a learning experience. And um, I like how you have expressed uh, missions local versus global. And the reason um, I'm just gravitating to that topic is because as a part of the research in the Baptist church, I find that we focus on missions as over there, not locally. But then one of my research books on mission together, it talks about local mission is really evangelism and global mission, the global level is mission. So I wanted to get your, um, I kind of want you to dig a little deeper and tell us, you know, it's like it is learning, but sometimes we just want the answer. Like missions is a part of all, you know, it's a part of our being. It's supposed to be our connection to God and our purpose as a lifestyle. But do you really see it as local? Um, and the reason I ask that question is because I'm trying to go into a, a, a part of the paper where I kind of want to say, um, you know, I don't know why I keep, I won't let this go, but is it more about resources? So I can say I did this, you know, my church sends money over, over there, or is it really my responsibility to have relationships so that even when I go overseas, I'm not creating orphans, you know, mm -hmm. as mentioned earlier, it is about uh, the relationship and salvation and seeing the physical need, but you know, what do I do after I leave? And, you know, whose responsibility is it to grow the people, you know, so that it's not just me going to meet the physical need, giving them salvation and then leaving, and now they're orphans. Mm. I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. Yes, makes a lot of sense. Well, we have a, a way to reconcile that. In, and I think Dr. Vestal in the very beginnings in CBF talks about the mission on church. And I think if, if we change that uh, missionary and, and that mission and that difference in between the global one and the local one for the missional church is the old church going to the whole, old people of God with the old people of God going to the whole world. So that's, that's a concept, concept that reconcile and that keep us, um, uh, keep us kind of safe <laughs> for, you know, uh, all models or, you know, wrong models on mission. So we need to embrace, uh, you know, my invitation is to embrace the, the missional uh, concept that there is a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, bibliography and missional and how to be missional. And I think it's, it's important to embrace that in order not to have many of orphans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as I said, um, and from, from my family of faith, um, I think it's clear for, for CBF that we are not supporting the toxic charity model. We are not, we are trying not to spread the, the power model, first world to third world. And we are also empowering the whole, the, the, the church, the local church to do their mission locally. And one of the examples we have is we don't, we don't call our personal uh, in the field, we, we call field personal and not missionaries. Mm -hmm. And they have the same uh, commission if they are serving in their own community, like in Miami or in, um, in the Appalachians, uh, they're serving in the same and having the same conversations that the one that's, that are in, in Ukraine. So, and in, in this context, it's, it's very important. I'm but glad you that, said that. That needs a change of a structure also. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said Appalachia because we had Scarlett Jasper on here uh, one of the first weeks uh, who's a field personnel in, yeah, in Appalachia. Ruben, thank you so much for being a part of this class. If any of the students have any more questions, I'm going to ask them to email me and I'll send them to you and, and relay the answers. Uh, but I want to respect your time, Ruben. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to hang out with the class for a little bit, but you don't have to be a part of that. I, I know it's 6.30 uh, your time, and uh, you probably want to go check out that Argentinian grill. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. It has been a, a great pleasure, and what, what a great group. Thank you. Thanks bye -bye. so much, Ruben. <laughs> Adios.